David Frangioni here, Modern Drummer Podcast, live from Ironshore Studios in Grand Cayman, the one and only Mike Portnoy. Hey, man. And Kimo Williams. Please, Please check, check out, out our Red, Red Summer 1919. 1919. Streaming now. It's a must listen. Also with Mike Stern, Richard Bona, and Michael Brecker. Find out more at jkemowilliams.com. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having That's, me. Uh, well, thanks for being here. This is incredible. What do you think of Grand Cayman so far? This is beautiful. Um, this studio is, I don't know if you, the cameras, people at home could see, but literally overlooking the water. I don't know if I would ever get any work done here. <laughs> In fact, so far we haven't done anything. We're just enjoying the, the scenery, but it's beautiful here. Beautiful studio. And I am sure so happy to be here. Yeah, yeah it's thanks beautiful, right? Me. No, thanks for being here. Well, we have all kinds of things to cover. Um, You've been. This is your fifth modern drummer cover, if if I can count correctly, and uh, incredible. I mean, that's a very very elite group of drummers, which you so deservedly oh, well, you know you. should I be mean, in as you are. But this is really something, man. This is an awesome cover. It's an honor. I mean, it, I, the first time I was on the cover, actually, forget about the cover. Even just getting my first feature in '93, so 30 years ago, that was like I could have quit right there and then. It's like, okay, I'm done. I'm happy. Like I've I've been you know, written about in Modern Drummer Magazine, but then to get the first cover story and now to be up to five, I mean, it's it's just surreal. Like, the, the hugest honor. Well, the honor is all ours, and, and we're talking about doing a Legends book. I think we should do it. I would love I that. it's going to be, be incredible. Yeah, yeah those, the, that whole series is amazing. I mean, me as a, a, as a fan of Modern Drummer Magazine, I love those. those, those Great, great readings. Well, thanks. There's there's so much to unpack because we go into the drum kits, we go into the transcriptions, you know, we cover everything that we want to know as drummers yeah. about our favorite drummers. Love it. And of course, well, that Hall was the big fame. one. This is so I don't know how many drummers there have been at this point. Many, 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 many millions, tens of millions, right over time. And forty three of them wow. have been <laughs> forty three on this big Blue Earth, yeah, only forty three, yeah, and in the forty seven <laughs> years that we've been a publication, so this is the Hall of Fame. So Mike Portnoy's two thousand four Hall of Fame award. So this is super special to us, and we cherish it. So we wanted to bring it for this occasion. It, that you know, just talking about the covers, but that of of any award I've won in my entire career, that right there is the biggest honor of them all. I mean, to be. We were talking about this yesterday, but uh, at the time, 2004, it was almost well, 20 years ago at this point, I was not only um, the youngest one in there. Well, I think Neil Neil Peart was inducted when he was, I think, 37 or something, and I was whatever, I, I think the second youngest. But at the time, I was like the only hard rock rock drummer in there. You know, I don't, Not only was I significantly significantly younger than everybody, but I was also like... The only kind of like rock or metal guy, you know, like it was all John Bonham, Keith Moon, Ringo, uh, Ginger Baker, Simon Phillips, Bill Bruford, all my heroes. So to be acknowledged and included with all of my biggest inspirations and biggest heroes was just mind blowing to me. 
Well, it's a great accomplishment to say the least. I know that that this is our Hall of Fame. This is our community's Hall of Fame, and and we you know we pay tribute to uh, the Trailblazers, which you've done so many things, and and there's a lot of you know coverage stories, if you will, of of your career, and and so we don't have to go back to the beginning because it's been covered at infinitum, right? But I do want to pick it up from the Neil Peart. Uh, 2020 Modern Drummer Festival, which you were a very significant part of, and it's like the the biggest festival we've ever had, right? Because it was virtual, right. and the the older festivals, the 19 festivals prior, were all in person, and they capped out at you know a few thousand people, maybe. That festival was tens of thousands. It was wow. like it was a blockbuster by any metric, you know, drumming right. or or otherwise. Um, so, what do you? Well, let's start there, right, and and kind of work our way up to to right now on in the on the cover and the winery dogs and all the things you're up to. So when you when we called you for that festival, you were incredibly gracious. You were uh, clearly uh, a fan and impacted by Neil's work and to Absolutely. pay tribute. And you just slayed your performance on that candy apple red kit. Yeah. So just take us back to that and and just Neil in general and your you know, right. your your thoughts and history with him. Well, that year was so significant, 2020, because not only were we all in lockdown, which was surreal and strange to begin with, but that was also the year that we lost Neil. So the whole drum community was, you know, still, still feeling the impact of, of losing him, which, you know, was just so, for a lot of people, completely shocking and sudden. I mean, I, I was aware of his illness, so I had a little time to mentally prepare that it might be coming, but... I know for the rest of the world that were, wasn't aware, it had to have been so shocking. Yeah. And uh, what a but, way to start 2020. Right? Yeah. We oh. know it was just going to get worse from yeah. there. Yeah. That was like pretty much the, the the starting point of the worst year ever. But I mean, one of the one of the the great things that came out of it was the the virtual Modern Drummer Festival and all, so many great performances on there. But for me to be able to uh, pay tribute to Neil and play my Neil replica kit, which Tama made me. Uh, back in 2005, I believe. So I, I did a Rush tribute back in 2005 where I, uh, I used that kit and then I was able to keep it and take it home. And actually, Neil signed the 15-inch Tom on that kit. Oh, so if, wow. you, if you go back and look at the, the performance, you look at the 15-inch Tom, you could see uh, Neil wrote a tribute to a tribute uh, and signed it for Oh, me. that's beautiful. Wow. But yeah, I mean, you know, Neil was obviously one of my... Biggest, biggest, biggest influences, if not the biggest. Um, when did you first hear him? He, he came around in my life when I was a young teen. I mean, I started before that, it, my three big heroes, when I was uh, just starting to play drums, my three big heroes were Ringo, John Bonham, and Keith Moon. So those three guys were my big drum heroes, learning how to play the kit, learning how to just get around the kit. And, and then uh, when I was a young teenager... I guess my taste was starting to develop into more progressive music and I wanted to, you know, explore drummers that were playing big kits and playing odd time signatures and progressive music. And, uh, you know, that's when I discovered the progressive drummers and Neil was the biggest, but there was also guys like Bill Bruford and Simon Phillips and Terry Bozio and guys like that, Phil Collins, you know, the more progressive drummers. But Neil was the top of the list. He was the, the game changer for me. And I became completely obsessed with, with him and Rush and learned all of his drum parts inside and out. And got What in. album were we at at this point? Where, well, where are you discovering This him? was around 81, so they had Moving just put out Moving Pictures. Yeah. Okay. So, which is weird because that's a little late in the game for me. You know, as I discovered Neil and Rush, I ended up going backwards, and it was the stuff before Moving Pictures that had the biggest influence on me. Like Hemispheres, Farewell to Kings, 2112, okay. Permanent Waves, those albums were just so hugely influential for me. But I came on board on the train in 81 right after they put out Mo Moving Pictures. And I remember I remember the moment that, that I got hooked. Because up until then, I had heard the name Rush, and I would hear, like, Closer to the Heart and Spirit of Radio on, on, on the radio and stuff like that. And I never really knew that they were these virtuoso musicians i would hear getty's vocals and then immediately immediately i just pigeoned them pigeonholed them into the same world as like super tramp or sticks or whatever i didn't really know 
And I remember after Moving Pictures came out, somebody played me YYZ. So I was able to just focus on the three of them and their musicianship without the vocals. And then I was like, oh my God, listen to this drummer. What the hell is going on here? And then from that point on, I was hooked, became obsessed, worked my way backwards through the entire catalog, started seeing them live every time they came through. And I would just, I would read Modern Drummer Magazine like, the way other kids were reading Playboy magazines. I was ordering all the back issues and looking at all the centerfolds of the drum kits and the ads. And I remember ordering the old Neil Peart uh, issues. Uh, and first one, he had the Slingerland yes, kit right yeah. on the front, which is his first cover. Yeah, I think around the time, I think that the issue that came out when I, once I was a fan, I think he was on the, on the cover on the Signals tour. And it had, um, I, had, I think he had a mustache at that time and he had the candy apple red yeah. kit that I ended up building the replica of but yeah that was around 81 82 and that was prime time rush for me and neil was just hugely hugely in influential for me and uh to this day probably had the biggest impact on my my drumming and my career wow and then as years go on you meet him right you yeah actually... i mean it took many years he you know he's he was famously uh elusive and and hard to private yeah, very, very private and hard to kind of infiltrate his inner circle. So it took many, many years before I met him. Um, I didn't meet him till 2005. And, um, and how did that happen? I was uh, a guest editor for, for another drum magazine in the UK. Uh, and they basically gave me my own issue and said, hey, you could be the guest editor of this guest editor of this issue and interview any of your four biggest heroes oh, and cool. they gave me this open palette to work with so obviously neil was number one on the list i, I had i had yet to meet him never met him uh and this was like this was my golden opportunity to finally you know uh infiltrate the bubble <laughs> and uh and interview him yeah right? so like well that was the best part about it yeah. because he's fame he was famously like turned off by people that would come at him with fanboy questions you know you come at him starting asking you know rush questions that's it <laughs> right he wasn't uh, but I, that was kind of my job you know i had to that was i had the excuse to be able to interview him and ask all the questions i've always wanted to ask him and get away with it you know he was there to be interviewed by me so i was able to to actually have that first experience and get all those questions out. And you saw him in person or was it on the phone? It was in person. He was, um, I guess he had just put out a book. I, I can't remember which one it was, maybe Ghost Rider or something, but he was on a book tour and was swinging through New York. So uh, this magazine um, set it up that I would actually go to his hotel room while when he was in New York. And I went with uh, a photographer and a transcriber uh, to record and film the, the interview. Great. And uh, yeah, that was my first time meeting him. That's he was amazing. so gracious. And that was the first time I f knew that his name was pronounced Peart because I heard it directly from the horse's mouth. He was in the room. He picked up the telephone. I, w I don't remember if he was ordering room service or whatever, but he was like, oh, yes, this is Mr. Peart in room 12, <laughs> room 2112, whatever room it was. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, he said Peart. Uh, all these years I've been pronouncing it wrong. I was even using Pert shampoo as a young fan. But uh, no, it, but that was the first time I met him, and he was so gracious, and we talked, and we chit-chat, and took photos together for the magazine. And I ended up doing the same with, with Bill Bruford and Nick Mason from Pink Floyd and Lars Ulrich from Metallica. So wow. those were the four that I... What a I, quartet. Yeah. I, I would have obviously picked Ringo, uh, but they had just featured Ringo in a recent issue, so they okay. wanted somebody else. So, yeah, it was Neil Bruford, Nick Mason, and Lars Ulrich. Wow, all huge influences in you, obviously, because yeah. that was the, the point of it. So then you met Neil later on, too, right? Well, from that point, uh, we became friends. Uh, you know, we, he would, uh, we would email each other. He would send me pictures of, you know, him and his, his daughter, who was just born. He'd send me pictures of them going to the library or dressing up for Halloween oh. or, oh, wow. you know, Olivia. Christmas cards. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So, he, you know, we became friends on a personal level uh, where we would share emails and uh, every time Rush came through, he always invited me out to come out for sound check and hang out and spend time in the afternoon. Oh, wow. He just was, I guess, once you're able to infiltrate that inner circle. And get to know him. He, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I guess maybe because our friendship, I, I never 
beyond that first meeting, I never asked him a, a million questions. It was always about other stuff. It, we talk about drumming, but it was more about both of us, you know, what we were going through. Your lives. Yeah, exactly. People. He would talk about, you know, aches and pains from doing this, and I would tell him the same, and he would, you know, he would be riding his motorcycle to and from the gigs. He would tell me about his travels or, like I said, send me pictures of, you know, his home life when he was off tour. And he just became, like, a, you know, a friend and somebody that was just so gracious. The fact that he would always invite me out to the shows. And uh, the last time I saw him was their farewell tour, 2015. And I wanted to, my son to see Rush before they retired. So I brought my son Max out. And Neil brought Max up to his kit and let him play the kit and gave him some signed heads and sticks. Oh, and wow. was just so and Max had never seen him time. before? No, that was Max's only time seeing Rush. Wow. And I was like, you know, this is a rite of passage. You've got to yeah. see them. You know, you have to experience this as a drummer. Uh, and, of course, he loved the show. And, and Neil was just so nice and kind and gracious to him. And Max is, in his own right, doing some incredible things. I mean, the, the apple isn't falling far from the tree, as they say. What's, what's happening with Max and how is he, you know, you've obviously been such a massive inspiration to him. What what's what's the latest with your son and and how did he kind of rise to where he is now? Because when I speak to either drumming, you know, industry people or music industry people that not specifically are drummers or in the drum industry, everybody tells me the same thing, Mike. They they uh, sing his praises. Oh, that's I awesome. mean, they talk about He's him. He's a great kid. They talk about him as a great kid and a great drummer and they're not just saying it to be nice like they really believe it so he's he's no, on to something he is he's he's 24 now he won uh modern drummer uh up readers poll for best up-and-coming drummer i guess it was around uh maybe 2019 maybe 25 years to the year that i won the up-and-coming award wow so yeah i won That's it i think incredible. in 90 three or four and then he won it 25 years later 2019 wow but no yeah coincidences i mean he he's become an amazing drummer in his own right and a lot of people ask me did he did i teach him and uh the the thing that blows a lot of people away is no i didn't teach him he actually um took lessons from a local guy in pennsylvania and i think that was really important for his development i mean the two main reasons a is i'm not a teacher it doesn't matter how many awards I've won or what I've done with my career, my drumming. I'm not a teacher. I don't think in those terms, in terms of having to break things down to, you know, its fundamentals. And, you know, he needed a teacher that could literally break all that stuff down and, and teach him the things that he needs to learn, which I wouldn't have been capable of giving to him. But the other thing is uh, I'm always away touring. He needed somebody that would be consistent Cons yeah consistent. you know so he could go every week and he gets his lessons and he had to do his homework and he had to practice so it was important for him to develop as a drummer with a proper teacher and, and that's he learned how to read music and learn how to break down things uh, and what age are we at with max at the, that you're describing you know, the, the age from 14 through 21 i think were the, that he's the, studying consistently yeah. and he's really digging in he went to music uh music high school uh uh, arts for you know for musicians and artists and stuff so he was able to learn how to read and and write and learn music theory same way i did you know I, when i was his age i was the same i wanted to consume it all and learn as much as i could but he did and and now he's he's doing great he's got his own band tala where he writes all the music for that band he literally writes all the music every instrument demos all the stuff at home and then presents it to the band uh, so that's his creative baby, but now he's also landed the gig playing drums for Code Orange, who was honestly one of his favorite bands. He was a huge, huge Code Orange fan. Like his three favorite bands were Code Orange, Slipknot, and Korn, uh, you know, a few years ago. And he ended up getting the gig uh, drumming for Code Orange, and the first tour they did was touring with Slipknot, and then after that, the next tour was op opening for Korn. Living so he ended, up, he ended up joining his favorite band and touring with his other two oh, favorite that's bands. Awesome. Wow. So, yeah, he's he literally is living the dream, and he's uh, just recorded his first album with Code Orange, which comes out um, in September. So, yeah, I, I, I couldn't be prouder of him. He's he's carrying the... Carrying the... The, the, the Portnoy torch. The, the torch, yeah. yeah. He really is. Well, congratulations, and we'll be hearing a lot more from Max Portnoy and Code Orange and Tala and, and all of his endeavors. So... You're in this crash book, 
right? So yeah, that's amazing. Crash the World's Greatest Drum Kits, and uh, it's been out for a bit. It's on Amazon as a coffee table book and as a Kindle book. And this kit in particular that we have in here, so here it is. So, well, first of all, this kit, what's the story with this one? That kit was from my um, second Winery Dogs album and tour. Uh, first Winery Dogs tour, I went out with a Bonham kit. And after all the years of the massive mammoth Dream Theater monster kits. You went out with a, basically a five-piece kit? Yeah, like a Bonzo five-piece kit. Just to show people that, you know, there's more to drumming than just these massive progressive kits, which are totally cool in their own right. But after doing that for decades, I wanted to come out with the Winery Dogs stripped down. So the first tour was a five-piece kit, but then the second album and tour was this kit. I wanted to go back to a double bass kit, and then this kit was all single-headed concert toms. Cool. I wanted to have something that was retro, very 70s sounding and looking, like in the vein of Alex Van Halen, Roger Taylor, Peter Chris, uh, Carl Palmer did it Carl for Palmer, a minute. Uh, Phil Collins, you right, know, all right. those great 70s drummers had these great single-headed kits. So I, I had never you know, toured with one of those, so we ended up building this kit, and that's what I used, not only with the Winery Dogs, but I think also uh, the Neil Morse Band as well for a few albums and tours afterwards. And now we have this kit. Now that, this is a monster. That is probably one of my most famous ones. That was my Siamese monster with Dream Theater, and I used it for the Six Degrees tour, which these heads are from, as well as the Train of Thought tour. That was around 2002 to 2004. And who ended up with this kid at one point? Frangioni Foundation. Yeah. 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 He, Talk about a small kid. world. Yeah. Modern Drummer Hall of Fame. Yeah. This is a. Uh... But that's that's one of my f probably most famous kits. It was, we had three of these. Back in the Dream Theater days, I would usually get three kits made for any tour cycle. And we'd keep one in America, one in Europe, and then one in Japan. Okay. So we don't have to ship them, especially when they're this massive. That it's yeah. a lot of shipping. Yeah, so, it certainly is. So there was only three on Earth, and you ended up with one of them. Amazing. Where are the other two? The other two, one is in my house, and one is in my drum storage unit. Oh, so the other two are still, They're in, still in, out there, in yeah. Portnoy land. So, the, so what do we have? We have a whole little... Well, the concept was basically two pedal. kits in one. So okay. you have the left side of the kit, which was more of a traditional double bass metal or pro progressive kind of setup with four octobons, three racks... And we had to do, we couldn't have a, a traditional floor tom there because it would get in the way of the kit. So we actually had a little pancake uh, tom, which was very shallow. It was deep. I think it was maybe 13 or 14 uh, head, but uh, shallow because we needed to be able to put my, my feet underneath it. So anyway, that was the left side of the kit. And then the right side of the kit was a more uh, unique uh untraditional setup and in, in, in this case i had a 20 inch tom i think it was a 20 or maybe 18 i'm not sure maybe it says here but it was a very small tom either an 18 or 20 and then i had uh the rack toms running backwards kind of like kenny aronoff and then two octos on the right a floor tom and then a gong drum so it was a more more experimental setup and basically the idea was like two kits in one and you would have two stools or you'd move two the thrones stool? two so thrones. i would so you know i could play some songs on one side uh, the more metal or progressive songs on the left side, and then the more experimental tunes on the right side. And I'd go back and forth, or also with the two thrones there, I was able to have, if any guest drummers came out to one of the concerts, uh, I could have them up and we could do a you know, dual drum solo and stuff like that. And side by side. Yeah, like oh, a that's, bicycle built That's to awesome. Two. Wow. But yeah, there it is. It's a perfect shot of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. So two, tri two single bass pedals on the left two kicks, and then a... A double bass pedal on on the right right side. So when we when we go to this now, let's go to your cover. This was shot on the latest Winery Dogs tour. So what are you playing nowadays? What's your kit? This is let's let's see it. It's an acrylic setup. Let's see if any of these shots really show it. There you go. It, uh, well, it's kind acrylic of acrylic shells. Okay. Yeah, Tama Acrylic. Yeah, Tama made for a short period of time. They made a, a series called the Mirage. Uh, so this was at that time I built a giant Mirage monster with Dream Theater. You know, a, a triple bass double kit like that, but with all the uh, acrylic shells. 
so anyway, I still have all those shells. So now so I've broken that giant double kit up into smaller ones. And this I, is one of them. Well, this, this is, is a, a smaller side. Uh, in the past, I've used the big acrylic side with Twisted Sister and uh, Adrenaline Mob I used it with and also, um, I think, Avenged Sevenfold as well. But uh, so the, I ended up using some of the stuff on the right side for this kit that I'm using with the winery dogs now. And it's basically back to a single base um, five-piece Bonham kit, but two octos in the front as well. So it's a five-piece Bonham kit with two octos, two additional octos in the front. And, it, it, and you know, they sound great. They look great under the lights, you know, change loud, colors and everything. right? They very, project. very loud. Yeah, yeah, big time. And how many snares? Uh, two snares. Well, actually, um, I've used this kit for both the Winery Dogs and John Petrucci's last solo tour. On John's solo tour, I had uh, my main 14 and then a 12-inch side snare. On the latest Winery Dogs tour, I ended up removing the side snare. So I might have still been using it in these pictures, but now currently that I'm on the road with it, it's just my main 14 only. I just scaled it back a little. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So... Hey, this is Vinnie Colliuta and Kimo Williams. Please, Please check, check out, out our Red, Red Summer 1919. 1919. It's streaming now. It's a must listen. Also with Mike Stern, Richard Bona, and Michael Brecker. Find out more at jkimowilliams.com. Winery Dogs is now going on 11 years. Yeah. And you guys are still out there just just killing it. You just a lot of touring this year, kind of getting back in the in the groove. And how's that been going? This whole year for me has been focused on the Winery Dogs. I mean, if you look at the last 10 years, anyone any pick any year in the last 10 years for me, I'm usually rotating 3 to 4 to 5 bands, you know, uh, all throughout the year. But this particular year, 2023, it's been pretty much exclusively the Winery Dogs just because we kind of got back together after a little hiatus and uh, just decided, hey, let's just focus on this band this year. And all three of us kind of just uh, have been exclusively in Winery Dog mode. So, yeah, it, you know, we did two U.S. legs. We did a South American leg. Uh, we've done one European leg. We're about to do a second European leg now in October and November. Then we go to Japan at the end of November. So, yeah, it's been a busy year for the dogs, pretty much and exclusively. New, new album? Yeah, or? we put out our third album came out this past February at the start of the cycle. And what's it called? Just three. Winery Dogs 3. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's third album, and there's three of us. We're a trio, and it's 2023. Yeah. So, yeah, it just seemed like the natural lazy album cover. <laughs> <laughs> album, album title, excuse me. And where did you guys record it? We did it at Richie's home studio. Um, we we wrote and recorded simultaneously, which I like to do. Um, I mean, I've done it both ways. I've done sessions and albums where you write and demo everything, and you live with it for a while. Right. Then you go back kind in. Kind of the traditional rock yeah. band mode. And there, you know, something to be said for that, you know, having the time to live with something and let it develop in your head. But I also am not the biggest fan of being inspired and writing something and then putting it on the shelf for six months and then having to relearn it and try to refine that inspiration months, months later. So there's something to be said for the other way, which is the way we've done this new Winery Dogs album, which is basically write and record right on the spot. So we would write a song and uh, me, Billy and Richie would just basically go into the, 
the rehearsal room in, at Richie's place, and the three of us just bounce ideas, and we, we'd put together the arrangement and form of the song. Okay, here's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, solo. You know, we're gonna go to modulate for the the th chorus at the end. You know, we just put together the whole arrangement, and then it's like while you're in that headspace and inspired by what you're writing, okay, hit record. And I would get my drum tracks right there and then while the song was brand new and fresh and inspired. So the whole album was done that way. With 10 songs, 10, you know, written one at a time and tracked as the song was written. Wow. Yeah. And have, had you ever done that before? I have. I've done that a lot, actually. Um, uh, to be honest, most of the stuff I've done since Dream Theater over the last you know, 12 years or whatever, it has been done that way. I, I like that. I'm comfortable that way. If you write something, hit record and capture it while it's fresh and inspired. And that's the moment. Right? Yeah. And I, I'm not the type of drummer, uh, you know, we were talking about Neil Peart earlier. He was very methodical, very, you know, he would write out his parts incredibly. Um, you know, every single fill was written and uh, worked out. I'm very much the opposite of that. I'm very, very much um, just kind of... Uh, spontaneous. Spontaneous, basically. totally. Like, it's all about the spontaneity for me. Even, like, my fills. Like, if I'm... Okay, we write a song. Let's get the drum tracks. Maybe I'll do three takes and, and then comp the drums afterwards. But within those three takes, my fills going from verse to chorus or chorus, you know, within the solo, whatever, any fills are completely spontaneous not premeditated they're just felt from moment to moment and then i'll usually comp the drum part and that carries over to live i'm not one of those drummers where okay that's the drum fill in the middle of the guitar solo and that's the drum fill at least to the last course i mean sometimes if there's a fill that's really memorable and the fans are expecting it okay i'll do it but really both in the studio and live i like to just fly on the seat of my pants and just just be in the moment and from night to night and take to take and gig to gig, just go for it, you know, and, and, and whatever comes out, comes out sometimes. Kind of a jazz approach. Yeah. Right. Because I mean, the jazz guys are always do, trying to do something different as opposed to the, op like you said, the opposite of Neil where he's playing parts back yeah. that you can transcribe and every night it's yeah. the same. But That's jazz not me. I, I, is I, a totally different thing. And, you know, for better or for worse, you know, there's something to be said for both ways. But for me, it keeps it interesting. Uh, I think if I had to play the same part every single night, which I have done on hired gun gigs, you know, if I got, you know, the tours I did with Avenged Sevenfold and Twisted Sister, those weren't my bands. It wasn't my music. Uh, I was hired to replicate somebody else's parts. So in those cases, yes, they're, the fans are expecting me to perform those fills as they are and you known. do. And I it's do. Like just that's that's what the music is about. But when it comes to my own music and my own gigs, I like leaving the the creative door open and just go for it from from show to show and section to section. And you found that after two or three of those takes, you've kind of said what you want to say. That's what I get the sense of, yeah. like from your playing. Like that's that's how I hear this. That's how I want to play it. There's a few variations. I, we got it. You know, people think I. And this overthinker, especially because all, all this pr really progressive music I've been a part of, uh, but I'm not a thinker. I'm a feeler. Like I don't want to overthink a drum fill or or a part. Like I want to. I want it to feel good and feel natural. Uh, and the same goes with you know the fills. You know I want it to feel it. I want to feel the moment, and um, that's more important to me than the technique or uh, you know writing something that's so structured yeah I, I like having the open-ended kind of uh, approach and being able to feel the music and being able to play whatever you hear takes obviously tremendous facility and chops which you've developed do you do you still practice like how do you keep your drumming at such a high level uh it's hard i hate saying this when i'm interviewed by a drum magazine or a drum podcast because it's such a a bad thing to say but to be honest i don't practice like i used to i think at this point in my life and career i'm i'm so busy as it is touring and recording with you know all these different bands 10 different bands at the moment i think is the current count for me i spend so much time doing it for a living that playing playing right uh that when i get home 
I want to spend time with my family. I want to spend time with my dog. I want to catch up on some movies or TV shows. So it's probably not a very inspiring thing to say. And uh, well, but, it is in a sense I, that I, you've, I you're still playing. My, I am playing so I spend, much. Right? I spend That's the muscle so, memory. That's the ability to just hear it and play it because it's got to come from somewhere. I mean, I spend so much time behind the kit as it is, whether it be writing, recording, or touring. Uh, that I just don't put in the practice hours like I used to. But that being said, I did. You know, I right. absolutely did. To get to did. this point, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, all throughout my developing years, I pr practiced constantly, you know, whether it be uh, playing to click tracks and metronomes or existing records or, uh, you know, reading charts, or, you know, reading Modern Drummer. Modern Drummer magazine was a huge, huge part of my development. You know, I would get the, I would look forward to the issue arriving every month for the inspiration and the education, uh, you know, reading the transcriptions, even just, you know, for Modern Trumpet Magazine, for me, it was even the ads, even seeing the ads from Tama or Sabian or whatever, I would look at them and just, you know, be so uh, interested in the, in the gear. So, yeah, you know, all those years of development, I was practicing constantly and practicing with my bands constantly and writing and development and developing, and it took decades you know, to, to get where I ended up getting. And now, now I just do it so much for a living that that's enough for me at this point in my life. Right. As long as you can play musically whatever you want, that's the end goal of practicing anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I would be lying if I didn't say I see some of these young drummers on Instagram or YouTube that technically are doing things that I couldn't do in a million years. I mean, I'd have to practice, you know, years to do some of the things that some of these young kids are doing so I, I am a little envious that i don't have those kind of chops anymore but i'm 56 years old i've been doing this professionally for over 30 years and you know i guess every dog has their day you know i had my years where i was really formative and really pushing the boundaries and and you know also they you know when i was coming up in the 90s there wasn't much progressive music Dream Theater was one of the few bands doing it. Now, you know, progressive drumming is is through the roof. You know, like I said, you go on social media and there's some drummers with these progressive chops that are just incredible. So I'd be lying if I didn't, if I wasn't saying that I'm, I wish I could do some of that stuff, but I just don't know if I have the time to, you know, to invest that it would take to develop that kind of stuff. So I guess I kind of have to just be content where I'm at at this point in my life you know maybe there'll come a time where like Neil Peart did you know he famously started taking lessons again later in his career so who knows what's down Changed the road his for me grip. yeah I went to traditional I think for me switching up the different bands I play with switching up the different kits within the different bands I play with all of these bands have different styles from each other so to me that's enough of a challenge to you right. know, from gig to gig to keep me on my toes and keep me developing and doing different approaches. Because you, know? you got to learn all these parts and all these songs, and that in and of itself is yeah. a form of practice. And they're all in different kits, so that yeah. inspires me as well. It keeps me on my toes. So. Well, it's awesome. You know, Modern Drummer, we've been through a lot, um, as you would imagine, through the pandemic, through the sea changes that, that have happened just in the world in media. And the reason that we're so committed, we being the Frangioni's drummers like yourself, our, our community, is for the drumming community. To me, Modern Drummer represents the, the larger picture, Absolutely. right? It's not about me. It's not about any one person specifically. It's about the fact that this is the only drum community that's 47 years old. And as we go every year there will never be a drum community that's older, right? As long as we just can keep going. And that's what's so important to, in my opinion, of what Modern Drummer really represents. It's just the one place where the drummer goes from the back of the stage, in the dark, behind a mountain of equipment, to the front of the stage, where we can celebrate, we can learn, we can be inspired. Absolutely. I mean, that's your experience that you've shared with me you know, off camera as well. I mean, like I, like I just said, Modern Drummer Magazine for me was a monthly ritual that I would sit home checking my mailbox every day. I couldn't wait to get the new issue. And uh, it was such a source of inspiration and education for me. And um, also the Modern Drummer Festival. I mean, that was a rite of passage, you know, for, for so many years. Uh, you know, for every year I would go to that to be able to see 
all these great inspiring drummers perform and learn from them and you know i i did it a couple times myself which was <laughs> i was scared shitless but uh you know i did them and you know i still have every issue of modern drummer from the beginning i have uh, you yeah, know, buddy Rich. I have them all at home in chronological order, in folders, year by year, issue by issue. I still have them all. So what is next? Uh, I don't know. You know, I have all these bands I play with, and uh, they kind of all just take turns in this rotation, this never-ending cycle of rotation. You're going to keep playing with them just yeah. just whenever their 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 time, time is to tour? Yeah, or I mean, whatever. right now I'm with the Winery Dogs, but... Um, uh, I just did some gigs with the Neil Morse Band uh, a few weekends ago, and uh, I guess in March I have some stuff with Flying Colors, which is another one of my bands, and uh, I have a gig in January with Metal Allegiance, which is one of my metal, you know, thrash kind of projects. So, yeah, there's this rotation of... Winery Dog's not going anywhere anytime soon, right? No. You guys are going to keep cranking. Yeah, I mean, that's the plan. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. So Alex Van Halen is now officially in the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame. 2023 Hall of Fame uh, inductee. I know you were inspired by Alex Van Halen. Big time, big time. I mean, first of all, congratulations, Alex. And it's long, long overdue. I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I feel that Alex might be one of the most underrated drummers of all time. I really do. Uh, obviously, his brother, Eddie, got so much attention for what he did on the guitar and changing the world of guitar, but I, I think it often uh, overshadowed Alex's uh, brilliance on his, his instrument. Innovation. Yeah, his innovation, big time. So, yeah, I, I, I've been a, an Alex Van Halen fan you know, since Van Halen came out in, in the late 70s, early 80s, and uh, you know, his innovation and his playing and his inspiration uh, is so... Uh, so... Uh, deserving to be recognized to be in the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame. It should have happened decades ago, but I'm glad it's now a better late than never. And I'm here with you. Uh, we're going to, you know, talk about Alex, and I'm going to play some of his yeah. parts. I mean, his kit is here with us, which is incredible. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, this is going to be a fun uh, project here, getting to pay tribute to Alex uh, and play his kit and talk about him. He, he was, um, you know... When I first started playing in a band, it was around 1982, I started playing in my first band. It was a band called Intruder, and we just did covers. And a huge, huge part of our repertoire was Van Halen. So uh, my first experiences playing in a band, a big, big part of that was learning Alex's drum parts. And uh, he was... Uh, one of the first drummers I had ever seen with four bass drums. You know, it was one thing for drummers to have two bass drums at the time, but he came out with four, and this this giant wall of drums, you know, with the octobons in the front and the four bass drums and the gong that he lit on fire. I mean, he was just such a showman, you know. That, it, that had to have been one of the biggest kits at the time. It had for to sure. It probably still yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, learning his drum parts. I mean, he, he was so innovative, and uh, I'll talk about a lot of them, you know, in the series that we're going to be filming here, uh, breaking down some some parts and some ones that had a big influence on me. But I mean, such an influential drummer, especially for my generation. You know, is people that the guys that are my age that kind of grew up playing bands in the in the early '80s. He was for all of us one of the one of the biggest influences. Yep, yeah, absolutely, and it's true. He is such an iconic drummer, and by the standard that we're referring to, Bonham, Moon, Ringo, like you know Neil, he he never got that level of his due, as you said. Even though he's he's highly revered, and it, of course Eddie's shadow, so to speak, you know, just naturally I think because Eddie is was is such an innovator. Uh, but when we're breaking down these parts, um, it's amazing, like how much nuance and intricacy and the Latin influence, the the funk influence, yeah. the rock influence, the Bonham influence. Like it's totally, it's incredible how you know it's it's not straight ahead, just like you know, you know, straight ahead rock drumming by any means. No. It's it's so innovative. I mean, I'll I'm, I'll probably talk about it, but to to mention here as well, you even take some of Van Halen's most known songs, you know, Jump. Jump is one of the most f 
famous songs in their catalog. His number one hit single is, you know, everybody in the world knows that song. Listen to the drumming underneath the guitar solo. <laughs> like, what the hell is he doing there? And it's the same on a with, hit song. Yeah, on a hit song like that. The same with Unchained. Like, Unchained has this incredibly bizarre drum pattern on the pre-chorus and the guitar solo. So it's that kind of innovation that sometimes wasn't even uh, noticed. You know, you kind of take it for granted um, yeah. that he was really doing these innovative things. And him and his brother together, they they had this musical bond because they were brothers. You, you'd see it with other uh, siblings that make music together. Or, you know, even uh, in Pantera, like Dimebag and Vinnie Paul, you know, they were two brothers playing guitar and drums the same way. Uh, you know, when you have that blood chemistry, there's something there that, that can't be... It's intangible. You can't analyze it. You can't formulate it. it it's there. It's natural. They're born with it. And uh, those two had it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right. When you listen to it, that's the thing that blows me away so much about Alex's drumming. You take Jump's a great example, where it's still chugging ahead. It's still rock pop like you know just really reliable grooving yeah. you know play for the song but drumistically like there's all these cool things going on like it's a you lot know? like bonham he, he had a lot of bonhamisms i think as well you could say the same thing about uh john bonham's playing but even down to the the tw big 26 inch kick and the 15 inch hats yeah. he had uh, a lot of those nuances and, and groove and power as well yeah, absolutely. Well, Modern Drummer Podcast. We're here live from Iron Shore Studios in Grand Cayman. Mike Portnoy, modern drummer, cover artist for the fifth time, Hall of Fame <laughs> award winner, Alex Van Halen. Congratulations from the entire drumming community, from Modern Drummer, from our entire family. Mike Portnoy, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Yeah.